Good morning, Dr. Lipsky. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about you and why you became interested in digestive health and uh, particularly in functional medicine approach to digestive health rather than conventional medicine? Sure. Well, hi, Laura. Thank you for having me on. We've been friends for a long time, and yeah. it's really great to have this opportunity to play with you in this way. Great. Um, so I've been a nutritionist for a really long time, and my very first nutrition teacher was Dr. Jeffrey Bland, mm -hmm. who is the founder of functional medicine. So I never learned nutrition or about health and healing any other way. Mm -hmm. And when I did my internship, I did it with two, uh, two physicians. One was a naturopathic doctor, and the other was uh, an integrative physician. So I really come at this holistic viewpoint um, naturally. It's just the way that I was taught. And why digestion was that in the early 1990s, I would go to these conferences offered by um, what's now Genova Diagnostic Labs and Doctors Data, and they would be teaching about the importance of digestion and gut function. And the more that I looked at it, I realized, oh, wow, if digestion doesn't work right, nothing works right. Because the whole point of eating food is to nourish every single cell in the body. And so we always start thinking about, well, what is somebody eating? But then it can have consequences all the way down the line. So if we can't digest the food properly, we're not going to get the benefits. If we can't absorb that food correctly into our bloodstream, and get it to the cells and get it inside the cells, it's also not gonna work right. And then if we can't get rid of the waste, think of how many people are constipated so or have motility issues. And so it just seems like the place to start. And whenever somebody has some kind of a complex health issue, we always kind of say, well, when in doubt, start with the gut because it is the really the river of life is this digestive system. And if it doesn't work right, then we just don't feel well in every possible way. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the dig in, D-I-G-I-N, the dig in model, which um, is the framework that you co-created to investigate and heal digestive issues and, and the one that you use in your book, Digestive Wellness? Absolutely. So. So the digging model is a way to really assess somebody's digestive strengths and their opportunities for change. So the D stands for digestion. And so some people might not have enough digestive enzymes, they might not have enough stomach acid, they might have too much stomach acid, and how can we support that? The second thing is I for intestinal permeability, which is um, leaky gut, and probably you've already interviewed other people about leaky gut, but leaky gut is when the small intestine allows compounds to come into the bloodstream that shouldn't be there. The small intestine has kind of a dual purpose. It's to allow nutrients and other molecules that are supposed to come into the bloodstream in, but to keep everything else out. And what happens when we're stressed out, which many of us are these days, and when we overindulge on alcohol or we take too many non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or, or aspirin, or when we take antibiotics or uh, hormones even, birth control pills, um, what happens is that we can get, or if we have a little infection, we can have an opportunity where the cells of this small intestine, it's almost like they've got like a, they get swollen and they kind of go like this and they allow molecules that come in in our food to go into our bloodstream. And so those molecules could be partially digested food molecules, or it could be bacteria or fungi or chemicals that come in with the food. And all of this, when it gets in the bloodstream, the bloodstream has no way to deal with it and just treats it as garbage. And then the immune system comes in to roll. And so we know that this increased intestinal permeability underlies 
all autoimmune conditions. And it also underlies when people have food sensitivities. Uh, and it's a major player in um, celiac disease. So that's the I. And, um, and then the, the G is the gut microbiome, which we could talk about for hours. It's so fascinating. But this five to seven pounds of microbes that live in our gut that are comprised of bacteria and fungi and even parasites, um, they they control our metabolism. They determine whether we're fat or whether we're thin, whether we're moody or whether we're kind of an optimistic, happy person to begin with. They control whether we get fatty liver. Um, even the, those microbes and their metabolites contribute to chronic kidney disease and glaucoma and Alzheimer's. So what we want to see is that there's a healthy microbiome and that there's a strong diversity and resilience in that microbiome. So that's the G in the DIGIN. The second I in DIGIN model is for inflammation and immune. And so we really want to look at, does somebody have a lot of inflammation? So for somebody who has GERD, um, gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn, we want to look and we go, well, that's inflammatory, right? It feels like pain. That signals inflammation. Um, does somebody have inflammatory bowel disease? Do they have discomfort? The, the digestive system shouldn't give us any discomfort. And if it does, it's basically telling us that something's wrong. And so we get a lot of gas and bloating and, you know, it's uncomfortable to have bowel movements it's signaling something's really wrong. And we do see immune responses and these inflammatory responses kind of all the way through, but also when the digestive system's not working right, we see those inflammatory responses as migraine headaches and fibromyalgia and eczema and psoriasis. So um, one, of, one of the great researchers on celiac disease in the world is Dr. Alessio Fasano. And what he says is, the gut is not like Las Vegas. What happens in the gut does not stay in the gut. Um, and then finally, we have in the Diggin model, we have N, which is for the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system is that gut brain reaction. It's the, the butterflies that I got in my stomach before we started this interview, yeah. right? It's, it's how we know that the gut and the brain are connected. And what we can see is that when we're off kilter in our mind, our digestive system doesn't work that great because probably we're not eating the right things anymore. Um, and also we can see when the gut is out of balance that we can get more depression, more anxiety. Even something like schizophrenia, um, we have dozens and dozens of papers on how schizophrenia is really related to a gluten intolerance, possibly undiagnosed celiac disease, and even um, a dairy intolerance. And so we can see that this relationship between the digestive system and the brain is really important. And it's connected by a nerve called the vagus nerve, which is the, called the wanderer, because it starts by, by um, uh, regulating dilation of our pupils and goes all the way through the body into the bladder and tells us when it's time to urinate. And so in the digestive system, most of the digestive system and this vagus nerve runs on what we call the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our, oh, I just went for a hike or I just took a nap in the middle of the afternoon or I read a really juicy novel or whatever. It's the it's that relaxation response that we have. And most of us really don't pay a lot of attention to that because we're running around all the time. So we now have probiotics and we have foods that help regulate the, this vagus nerve and help regulate the digestive brain connection. A lot of things to look at. Um, and so the book is organized around this model, looking at each of these factors for, for various complaints. Um, so the most common digestive complaints that I get questions about on the AlgaCal community are GERD 
and um, Luce Jules. And so I'm hoping you can share some of your insights about both. Um, and I'm hoping we could just talk about GERD first. Uh, so you discuss GERD in detail and digestive well wellness. So um, anyone with this health condition can get the full scoop in your book. But today I'm hoping you can just share a few insights as to the possible causes, you know, why people develop this and uh, what people should start to think about to, to heal. I think this is such an important question. 40% um, of us, more than 40% have GERD at least once a month. 20% um, of us have GERD at least once a week, 10% of us at least daily. So this is a big issue. So that said, we use that stomach acid to protect us against getting parasitic infections, um, ye fungal infections like yeast infections, and also bacterial infections. And we have almost an epidemic of kind of gas and bloating in this country, which is caused by those infections that come in on food. And so when we don't have that acid, those microbes don't actually get killed on first contact with the stomach. And so um, and then what happens is they can proliferate lower in the GI tract. We also use that stomach acid to absorb minerals. When the food leaves the stomach, it goes into the first part of the, the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. And in the duodenum, we still have that acid and um, nutrients, minerals like iron and calcium and manganese and potassium and magnesium and zinc all require an acidic environment to be absorbed best. And so when we're taking a proton pump inhibitor, we're blocking mineral absorption, which we know all the minerals are so critically important for bone health. You know, they're not my first uh, choice. Other things that can really help are, are things like acupuncture, and chiropractic manipulation. There are some people who have GERD just because they have what's called a hiatal hernia, which is the, the diaphragm is kind of pushing up and it causes you to have GERD. And so a skilled osteopathic physician or, or a chiropractor or even a naturopathic doctor who does manipulative therapies can help put this back into place. And i worked with um with people over the years who that's really helped and they're like what it's gone and then other things that i've seen is that sometimes it's food sensitivities i had one woman i was working with and she discovered we discovered that every time she ate eggs she would have heartburn and there's you know this long kind of list of things that are put out like peppermint and chocolate and cabbage and cucumbers and tomatoes and things like that. But I would encourage if you have heartburn or GERD to try to keep track of it yourself. Write down a meal that you feel bad after and try to track it down and see if you can figure out what foods are triggering you because it's different for each person. And food sensitivities play a huge role in this. And then we also have some wonderful kind of natural compounds that you can try using. One is called DGL licorice. Um, it's a, a taste like licorice and they're usually chewables. And um, it's had the glycerizing removed from it so that it can't cause high blood pressure. Um, but it's very soothing, especially to the esophagus. Um, we also have um, um, aloe vera, which I wish we had a lot more research on, but historically it's been used for GERD for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, drinking a, a half a cup of, or a quarter of a cup or whatever the, the, the product that you're taking recommends, mm -hmm. um, or you can even get it in capsules and, and pills. Mm -hmm. It's very, very useful for, for, um, the digestive system all the way through. It's very soothing. And then we have demulcent foods. We have foods such as, um, as um, okra and licorice tea and um, radishes and, and other foods that are very soothing to the GI tract. So I think that there are a lot of different um, solutions 
And, you know, you have to be your own health detective to figure out what's going to really work for you. Um, But food sensitivities are a huge one. Oh, yeah. And stress. That vagal tone, again, that that gut brain connection plays a huge role in heartburn. And so one of the pieces, you know, there's a reason why people used to say grace or hold hands or close their eyes for a few breaths before a meal to kind of stop their day and start their digestion. And so, you know, it that giving of gratitude for the food and the people who brought it to us is an enormous um, benefit to helping with the digestion because it slows us down. So eat at a table, sit down, yeah. take a few breaths, you know, do some ritual that makes sense to you. And um, also look at stress throughout your day um, and try to figure out where you can fill your cup. Wow, those are some really great ideas. Uh, thank you for that. that. Many I didn't know about. Um, so and uh, the other frequent complaint that I, I hear about is loose stools. Uh, women write in saying they experienced loose stools or they even had diarrhea um, when they began taking Algecal Plus and Strontium Boost. And I've thought that the most likely causes are problems absorbing the magnesium that's provided by Algecal Plus or um, some unfriendly critters in the digestive tract um, that steal the citrate that Strontium Boost provides and then use it to fuel their own metabolism. Um, so I have suggested to improve magnesium absorption trying P5P uh, since this is the active form of, the, of B6 that's required to get magnesium into cells. Um, and at least 25% of us have a genetic inheritance that renders them less able to uh, convert B6 to P5P. And often this helps. Um, in digestive wellness, I noticed that you recommend choline citrate um, as a supplement that can help improve magnesium absorption. And I'd never heard about that. And so I'm hoping you can uh, share some thoughts about it. Yeah, I learned about magnesium citrate from one of my mentors, Dr. Russell Jaffe, and he, gosh, I feel like Tahani in the good place. I'm just name dropping. Um, just, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it, but she's hysterical. Anyway, um, but but he was a very important and is an important mentor to me. Mm-hmm. And um, what he says is that when you use magnesium, when you lose, use choline citrate, and I'm not sure if any choline will work, because once you get something that works, you just kind of stick with it. Mm-hmm. But it's a liquid and you take just a teaspoon or so every day. Mm-hmm. And um, it allows for the magnesium to be absorbed better. And one of the fascinating things to me about magnesium is that it, if we don't have enough magnesium, we're constipated. And when we have too much magnesium, we get loose stools from it. And so I've used magnesium quite often as a way to get people's motility working better. So if if somebody tends to be constipated, it's something that I use. And I had one client I was working with and she would have a bowel movement maybe twice a week. And so I recommended some magnesium and she started taking huge amounts of magnesium, like 2,500 milligrams a day, whereas the recommended dose requirement for all of us is around 400 milligrams and all of a sudden her bowel movements were really great and I added uh, recommended that she take some choline citrate Mm -hmm. and within a few days her needs went down to about a thousand milligrams great you know so it really helps so if the p5p b6 doesn't work right well enough Mm -hmm. then you can try that and then you know the other piece is such an interesting one about the microbes feeding on the citrate Um, because citrate is an organic substance that the body uses in a lot of different ways. And, and so, you know, we don't have any research on it, but it may be that eating more fermented foods or taking a probiotic may be beneficial. Yeah. So can people just find the choline citrate on the internet? They can. It's made by a company called Perk, P-E-R-Q-U-E. Okay. And, and um, it's easy to find. And I'm sure that, that there are probably other companies probably have, who have copycat products. 
But it's a liquid, not it's just a liquid. A, okay. And it's sour, so you want to like mix it with a little bit of juice or something. Okay. So it's fine to add it to a like a little orange juice or sure. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, wonderful. So now we have another way to help with that. Um, do you think that low stomach acid production could cause loose stools when somebody starts taking AlgaCal Plus, which you know doesn't have citrate, it's just calcium and magnesium? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. You know, it, it could it could hamper the digestion, so it, it could, but my, I don't know. That's a good would, question. Would it be worth a trial of some, um, you know, hydrochloric acid with that in? Yeah, you know, if it helped. It, yes, absolutely. I think that betaine hydrochloride is is a really interesting supplement. It is um, it helps to replace some of that stomach acid that many of us don't have. You know, we think also of GERD as being too much acid, but mm -hmm. for a lot of us, it's too little acid. So there's um, some experiments that you can do to actually take some betaine HCL, take one capsule with a meal. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, we're going to find that it doesn't feel good to do that. It actually causes a little kind of heartburny feeling or it makes us feel worse in some way, which says, oh, good, you probably don't need this. Right. Um, and um, so it would be worth a trial of betaine HCL. It's also worth a trial of bitters. Oh, of yeah. Swedish bitters or moonshine bitters or any kind of bitters that you can find mm -hmm. because bitters also help stimulate um, uh, stomach acid production. Okay, great. Um, so if, if AlgaCal Plus is not causing loose stools, but then when somebody starts taking strontium boost, they, you know, they begin to have problems. Um, I've suggested just first stopping the strontium boost till things settle out and then starting back at half a dose. Um, so you're getting less citrate. And then if that doesn't help, I uh, typically suggest that they ask their doctor about running a CDSA 2.0 uh, with parasitology. Um, very often that turns out to be the case that, that, that they have some kind of critter. Um, are there other any other potential reasons you could think uh, people should look into for the loose stools that we haven't already talked about? You know, that that's a really good way to approach it. You know, I also some people like if somebody also has irritable bowel syndrome mm -hmm. with a tendency towards loose stools or constipation or back and forth, or they have any gas and bloating otherwise, mm -hmm. then I would also recommend doing breath testing to see if there's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because that can also be, I think some of this might be happening in the small intestine. What, what about Helicobacter pylori? Would I know that's fairly common infection. Would that cause these problems too? It could. I mean, it's it's best known for causing stomach ulcers and it's associated with stomach cancers. Um, and it can, it's also associated with ulcer, with a heartburn and GERD. So it's an easy test to do. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of questions about H. pylori because what we're finding is that there are strains that are pathogenic and then there are strains that are protective. Oh, interesting. And so, you know, if you find it and somebody has, you know, bad symptoms of ulcers or GERD, then a doctor wants to treat it. But but if you don't have any symptoms and you find it, it's sometimes better not to treat it. And I'm looking forward to the day when we have more sophisticated tests for H. pylori, mm -hmm. where we can see if it's if it's really a protective strain or not. It's like E. coli. We have flesh-eating E. coli, but then we also have even a probiotic that's an E. coli missile strain. So, you know, just because they have the same names doesn't mean they're, they're the same. Right. It's complicated. I wish it was so simple, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. I mean, I'm, like a car. And I'm still working on finding the absolute best diet and way to eat and so forth. And there are so many diets that they tell us are going to help improve digestion. Um, any suggestions about how somebody can figure out 
which one might be helpful. You know, the, the ketogenic diet and the vegan diet and the paleo diet and the, you know, low carb, high carb. It's so confusing. It's really confusing. Um, I wish we had, again, more research, but, but to date, here's kind of my approach to it. If somebody has um, an autoimmune condition mm-hmm. or they, they have um, joint pain, skin conditions, migraines, digestive stuff, I'd probably start with what we call a comprehensive elimination diet. Mm -hmm. And what that looks like is fruits, vegetables. Um, If if you eat meat, it would include fish and poultry and um, maybe things like bison bison and lamb. Um, If you don't eat meat, it would include legumes. Mm -hmm. If they're part of your regular diet, you don't want to start suddenly eating a lot of legumes if you're not used to them. So they can cause a lot of gas. Um, so, you know, and then some, it also has um, non gluten containing grains and some mm-hmm. seeds like sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds. And um, what I like about this approach is you could go to a restaurant, not that I'm going to restaurants these days, but you could, <laughs> you could walk into a restaurant and you could order something mm-hmm. that would make sense and that you can use olive oil and sunflower oil and walnut oil avocado oil, things like that in it, herbs and spices. Um, What it doesn't have is gluten, dairy, eggs, processed foods, alcohol, sugar. And what you can see in so many people is that within a week or two, their symptoms are starting to really shut down. I've seen so many, so many, um, so many things from high blood pressure to arthritis to irritable bowel syndrome to depression, uh, anxiety, I've, migraines. I've seen so many different things just kind of disappear within a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, so that's kind of one of my go-tos and whether that's a vegetarian diet or a animal-based diet, it, it doesn't really matter to me. If somebody comes in and their only complaint really is that they've got irritable bowel syndrome, mm-hmm. I would use choose a low FODMAP diet because that is the one that has been researched and researched and researched for irritable bowel syndrome. And unfortunately, we only have one paper on um, what's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, Mm -hmm. but but that also would be amenable to the low FODMAP diet. And the reason is, is that over half of people who have been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, which is for women about 16 to 18% of us have irritable bowel syndrome. And um, more than half of those people have um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which can be treated with this diet, the low FODMAP diet, and also with um, herbs or antibiotics like rifaximin. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tell you a story. An old friend called me about six months ago, and she said, I am in so much pain, refer me to somebody because I'm not in practice anymore. And I said, well, the person I know in your town charges $750 for a first visit. So tell me what's going on. And she said, well, I've had IBS, this gas and bloating for about 15 years at least. And my recently in February, we went on this trip And we wined and dined. And on the plane coming home, I spent the entire time, the entire time in the bathroom having the runs. Oh my gosh. And she said, she said, from the moment I walked on the plane, I just walked into the bathroom and I stayed there the entire time. So I'm like, okay, it sounds like she got food poisoning because it comes on fast like that and violently. But usually it's over in a day or two and it's kind of flushed itself out. I said, okay, let's um, try. She had gone to see her doctor that morning and her doctor had given her an antibiotic that was kind of broad spectrum. And we started this low FODMAP diet. Within two weeks, she was going, I have not felt like this in decades. I feel so good. I don't have any gas. I don't have any bloating. Um, um, I said, okay, well, it's been decades. I'm glad you're feeling so well, but I'm. this might not be permanent. 
And so just watch when you start adding foods back in on the diet and let's see what happens over time. Because what I see very often is in six, within six to eight weeks, the infection starts growing again and people start getting more gas, more bloating. Um, and so, so um, I followed up we, with a round of um, some herbs that had oregano oil and thyme oil and berberine. And um, she got strict again on the diet. And now she's about six months out and she's more liberal with what she can eat. Mm -hmm. And she's really feeling like a whole new person. Wow. And, you know, I think one of the things that happens to us, whether it's bone loss or, or whatever kind of crazy things that our bodies do to us, we get hopeless and we just learn to live with it. And, you know, like you didn't learn to live with your bone loss. You just Ew. said, there's got to be something I can do. Right. Yeah. And, and so I think it's very important that, um, that we don't just learn to live with all these quirks that our bodies have. It, it, we might still have them, but we got to go down kicking and screaming if, if we still have to have them. I think our bodies have incredible recuperative powers. If they just start, stop getting hammered and they get a little support, they will rebuild for us. So um, to learn more, can you tell us a little about your online course, The Art of Digestive Wellness? Um, and Specifically, will normal, non-medical people be able to understand it? Well, if you could understand me today, then I think you'll be able to understand it. If you didn't understand me, then no. <laughs> okay. So who is that? <laughs> so, so tell us a little about what, you know, what's, what does the course cover and what will people uh, learn, you know, take away from it that will help them? Yeah, well, I think a lot of people will get what they need from my book digestive wellness, which is in its fifth edition. But while I was writing the book, I kept thinking, there's more that I want to explain. There's things I want to be able to show people. I want to show them how to cook fermented foods and cultured food and make a cashew coconut kefir. And I want to be able to show them how to make kimchi. And I want to be able to show them bitters and enzymes. And I want to really walk through the different diets for for GI issues, like when would you use a specific carbohydrate diet? I'd use that for somebody with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. You know, so when would you start choosing different ways and how do you really think about doing it? And why is the microbiome so important and how do I think about it? Um, so there are questionnaires, there are, there are handouts, there are, uh, 28 videos that are mostly 20 to 35 minutes long. There are uh, 40 different handouts. There are now 11 cooking videos, oh, um, tons of recipes. And, and um, if you want to know a little bit more about it, I also have a, a free questionnaire. It's called the Digestive Health Appraisal Questionnaire. I mm -hmm. call it the DHAC. Um, <laughs> and if you go to... Uh, dhaq.info then you can just download this yeah you can just download the questionnaire and it goes through 15 areas of digestion to let you know could this be liver gallbladder could it be enzymes could it be that i have maybe a gluten intolerance or celiac disease or dysbiosis maybe i have SIBO or fungal overgrowth or whatever so, you know, my whole thing is like, how can you take something complicated and make it easy for you to use so that you can also walk into your doctor's office and say, I want you to test me for this. I think I have this. Yeah, I, we really do have to be informed um, because many of our doctors aren't really well informed about, you know, they just prescribe some medication to help the symptoms go away, but they don't most many doctors don't try to look for the root cause of the problem and so we have to be our own sorry my cat <laughs> i keep seeing this kind yeah, of yeah it's it's her tail but sorry <laughs> she's decided she needs to be petted right now so um yes why not so, yeah 
So, and then people can, um, if you take the course, because I, I want to take the course, um, I'm asking my family to give it to me as my Christmas present this year. Um, so to take the course, you can watch it when you, when you want to, you can watch things over again, right? You download the material and then you have it and you can look at it when you, when you want it. And yeah, I would encourage um, anybody who, who listens to our interview who is having digestive complaints to at least go take the, the free download um, questionnaire and work through that and, um, and see what they come up with because I think it'll be very helpful. Well, Liz, I love you and um, I'm so glad you agreed to do this and I hope it will help lots of our uh, people who are watching and, um, and I wish you every happiness and the best of health. Thanks, Laura. It was my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. See you soon, I hope. Okay. I hope. Yeah, okay. Bye.